Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate. They said, yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, even in the darkest hours, they said, yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. On this Memorial Day weekend, we certainly take time and pause to honor the men and women who have given their lives uh, bravely uh, for us to have the freedoms and the protections that we have here in the United States of America. And as we pause to do that, we again would not only thank them for saying yes uh, to going into service, but certainly a special thank you to our families who are here as well today, uh, thinking about the loss of their loved ones. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and again uh, ask his blessing on our time together. Father, we do uh, thank you so much for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice uh, to die for us for the freedoms that we have and the freedoms that we experience uh, in the course of our lives. Father, we're so grateful for men and women who uh, said yes to serving uh, our country in this way. We would ask for your protection for those across the world today, uh, that as they would serve and continue to protect and provide for us, that you would give them the safety uh, that they need. Thank you, Father, for our families who have sacrificed as well. And I uh, just ask that you would continue to give them uh, not only encouragement, but on this Memorial Day, uh, might they know that we honor and are so grateful uh, for their loved ones. We also thank you, Heavenly Father, for the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us. And it's because of his presence in our lives that we can gather together to worship you. So as we examine your word today, Father, I pray that you would bless our time together. Uh, that you would encourage us and challenge us uh, from the teaching of your word. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Thank you again for being with us today. And our challenge for today, as we think about uh, the life changes that we have, uh, is gathering the right perspective uh, with the life changes and the challenges that we have. Uh, you know, it's been quite a tumultuous couple of months, has it not? Uh, certainly, we're ready to move on to bigger and, and better things in our lives, I'm sure. And regardless of what your opinion might be about, in this particular case, the COVID-19 crisis or how it's been handled over the course of time, um, I've imagined that there's been a time in your life just like mine. Boy, if they would only listen to me and listen to my ideas, uh, things might be a little bit different. And we probably all have those personal uh, times in our life, but certainly this time has been very tumultuous. It's brought a lot of stress uh, on our lives, the family life that we have, uh, certainly the life of our community and the life of our church. And maybe, maybe you haven't been really affected that much uh, personally, but, but I know that we've all gone through many changes in our lives. Many things have changed over the course of our lives here on this earth, and we've been affected by it. Perhaps uh, it was a job loss. Uh, has happened quite a few times in the case of our church family. We've had folks who, because of their jobs, have had to move to other states, uh, left their family behind. Uh, perhaps it's marital issues or divorce, uh, other struggles in your family life uh, that would cause such changes uh, to really bring some added stress into your life. And so today, uh, we want to think about how we can have the right perspective uh, with regards to those changes in our lives. I submit to you that with regards to uh, the virus and COVID-19, I've struggled with this particular change in my life, uh, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Uh, we're also struggling on a personal way right now with our family, uh, an extended family, and dealing with some issues uh, medically there as well. And I think we all want to handle these changes the way God would have us to. 
Uh, but the point is this. Life is not meant to be lived around the changes in our life. Let me say that again. Life is not meant to be lived around the changes in our life. Life is lived in the changes. So think about that with us this morning. And for the true believer, the one who is following the Lord Jesus Christ, God is in the middle of all of these life changes. And so what we do, how we handle these changes, will determine how much stress we have in our lives, how much it impacts us. Uh, my wife was always reminding me of finding ways to bring the stress level down a little bit. And, and we all have those times in our lives when it builds up to the point that these changes really cause us problems. And I would submit to you that the changes that we have in our life, whether they be the present circumstances or something that would happen down the road, they are really the context for growth in our lives as a Christian. And so the challenge for us today is to have the right perspective with the changes in our life. I'd like to share three points with you this morning uh, as we think about that and uh, think about it along a personal level as well. The first one is very simply this. When we go through changes in our life or challenges like this, we need to first and foremost seek God's perspective during that change in our life. Let me read for you uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, speaking here uh, with regards to himself and the world itself. And this one particular verse is so very important. The Lord uh, pointed this verse out to me this week again. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And, and just be reminded, as you said, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have these changes. You're going to have these difficulties. You're going to have COVID-19 viruses. And as a result of all of these things, he says, be of good cheer. And then notice, if you would, that last line. It's the past tense. Jesus says, I have, I have overcome the world. It's something that took place, obviously, for the believer, we understand. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all of these things into his control with regards to the human aspects of life. And we need to be invested in the changes and the crises that are going on in our lives. But we also need to remember this. God's reality of what's happening is different than ours. It's greater than our understanding. The scriptures tell us that repeatedly, that we can't understand him. We mentioned that in a previous message. So the question then for me uh, is, what is God really doing in this time in my life? Part of the stress that's going on right now. We look around us, we see the big box stores open, for example, our small businesses aren't allowed, and, and so we have a lot of businesses that are, that are going to disappear. Um, our governors are telling us that we need to close our churches, that, that they shouldn't be here, they should be shut down, even though they don't have the legal jurisdiction to do that. There was a choice made by our elders here at South Pike Community Church a couple months ago. Not uh, caving, if you would, to the desires of our government, but understanding the health needs of our church family. And so as a result of that, we decided that it would be important for us to close. And all of this happening at the same time when groups, for example, like Planned Parenthood, give, are given millions of dollars by the federal government to continue to take the unborn child to take its life, to understand all of these things, and, and even today promoting, as they would call them, teleabortions. So as, as a child of God, I have to be honest with you, I basically said to God, and I did this respectfully, but are you kidding me, God? Are you really allowing these things to take place? And I have to admit that I had a problem with my attitude uh, during these times. A, a little bit ticked, if you would, uh, a little bit upset at God because he, he, he didn't tell the leaders exactly what to do in this particular case. Or maybe there's some other change or a crisis in, the, in our lives and, and things are just going crazy all of a sudden. And we begin to think, you know what, God? I think I have a better way of handling this situation. 
You know what, God? I, I think I have a better way of allowing things to come to fruition in my life. Think about the Apostle Paul for just a moment. Paul was shipwrecked. He was constantly scrutinized by the political leaders and, and even some of the church leaders, as you would read his letters in the New Testament. He was put in prison, obviously, because of his faith. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, as Paul was there sitting in that prison, he might have said, you know what, Lord, I could do an awful lot more if I was out of this prison and teaching in those local churches. Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. He had this right perspective. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. How does he do that? He says, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, can we really grasp that? Can we really understand that as a child of God, Christ living in me so that by faith in him, I can survive the crisis of my life or the change in my life, the circumstances that are going on. I can make it through whatever it is that I'm going through at that point in my life. Again, I would, I would probably say to God, and I know I have many times, you know, God, I, I could handle this or I think I would handle that a little bit differently. And it's easy to forget what Jesus says there in the gospel of John chapter 16. He said, you're going to have trouble. He says, but take heart. I've already overcome the world. We need to see God in the midst of the changes in our lives. The things that oftentimes we have no control over. Listen, God is bigger than us. Amen. And we need to be reminded of that throughout the course of our life. So the first principle is to seek God's perspective during our changes in life. The second principle this morning is simply this. During the change, during the changes in my life, ask God to help us to be able to become more mature as an individual, as a Christian, certainly in our spiritual life. And I sometimes would challenge most of us to say that we probably don't like this part of the Christian life. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. As a child of God, sometimes going through those steps in my life become very difficult. And during change, I, I have to ask God to use this change in my life to mature me, to help me to grow up a little bit. And I want you to notice what he talks, what he's talking about there. He's, he's really just talking about our character. Uh, the lifestyle of the believer. And the idea here is that our experiences in life, the changes in our life, the crises that we go through are to help us grow up, help us to become more mature. And it's easy for us to talk about this to our kids, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure, I mean, many of you have probably done it this way. You know, you, you discipline your child and you say, you know what, son, this spanking, this spanking is for your good. And so that you can understand what you did and how you can improve that. My mom and dad used to be real good about giving me that line. They said it would build your character. You know, this experience in life, they say, would help you. What about that teenager in your life? You know, when they have their first love crush and, and all of a sudden, uh, one day, the forever love tells them that they don't want to be their love partner anymore. And you simply say to them, you know what, that's character. That's a building of your life. But what happens when we become an adult? We come up against these changes. Our job changes. We have to move. Uh, in our church here, we have an elder uh, and his wife who moved to be with the rest of their family. Friends leave the area. Whatever the changes may be in the course or the change of leadership uh, in our church. A virus 
brings life to a halt. It's a lot harder for us then to understand that God is trying to build our character. The reality is this. God is less concerned about the end result of our crisis and more interested in the life that he wants to change for his glory. You know, from a purely human perspective, that's hard sometimes to accept, isn't it? We want all things to work out for good the way we want them or what we think ought to be good for us. We need to go to the Lord and say, you know, God, what, what are you trying to do in my life? What are you trying to teach me during this? Tell me where I need to grow. Tell me, because he's interested in my life. You know, God, what are you trying to create in me? Is he trying to create patience, uh, honesty, love, submission? It takes that time of, of prayer and being in God's word and seeking counsel from the Lord so that we can become, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, a verse that we oftentimes share. And in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the things that should be developed in our life. And perhaps God is, during this change, he wants to change some aspect of your spiritual life. Paul puts it this way, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is the, are the aspects that we should have. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, or patience. And Paul reminds us that that aspect of the spiritual life is something that God wants in you. And perhaps this change in your life or this change in our lives is there to teach us some aspect of our faith. In Proverbs chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, Solomon reminds us that sometimes it's that godly friend that we need to have counsel to. That godly friend in our life who, who sits down and, and helps us to understand what may be going on. And they can more openly see it. Solomon puts it this way, open rebuke is better than love concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes it's that godly friend that gives us that dose of reality. But when it's all said and done in the course of our life, oh, that we'd be able to say, God, I've learned from this lesson. I've learned from this change in my life. And I guess the question I would have for all of us as we've gone through these months, last couple of months, is what has God done and what has God changed in your life as a result of what's happened? So seek, first of all, his perspective. And then during that change, ask God to use this time to mature us in our faith. And then thirdly, very importantly, during the change in my life, don't let Satan gain any victory in your life. Don't let him have any victory at all. Remember the Apostle Paul, all the things that he went through. He was put in jail, obviously. He was whipped. He, he faced death. He was tired many times. I want you to look and listen carefully to his words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Talking about all of the aspects of his ministry and then thinking back to the things that had happened and transpired in the course of his life. And here's what he says at the end of that same chapter, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those changes that God is willing to make. Don't allow any of these changes in our life to give any victory at all to Satan in the course of our walk. Christian friend, don't lose hope. God, God is working in our life. He's working in our church. He's working in our, in, our, in our families' lives and in the life of the church for his glory. So share his presence in your life with somebody else this week. Let them know about the presence of God. Let them see the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And I pray that God would use this time for his glory. We love you all very much, and we pray your best, God's best for you, and we invite you to come back. Uh, we've begun our services again here at the church, so we invite you to come when you feel comfortable and ready to do so uh, to worship the Lord. But let's always remember 
that as we go through these changes to see God's perspective, to, to ask him to mature us, and then certainly to make sure that Satan doesn't have any victory in the course of our lives. Father God, I pray that you would encourage us, that you would teach us, that you would admonish us as Christians in the course of our life to see these changes and these things in our life, especially now as we're experiencing this, that Father, you would, that you would move in our hearts and that you would make us better and stronger for you so that the kingdom of God would be expanded because people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for each and every one of us. And I pray, Father, that any would be in the, in the hearing of my voice today would be reminded of the truth of Scripture, that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved and have eternal life. So, Father, we thank you for this time together. Might you be glorified in our lives this week. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Honor those in this time who gave the ultimate sacrifice for this country. Certainly give thanks to Almighty God for the ultimate sacrifice of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week. My fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him, we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war but bravely faced them. Certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one, that he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, we simply say with pride, thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms.